Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Pitts. I'm from the music department at the University of Sheffield. And I'm going to talk today about research I'm doing into musical life histories, asking the slightly provocative question, what did your music teacher do for you? I found on the internet a picture of my old music teacher. I thought he looked like Andrew Lloyd Webber at the time. I'm getting more Jamie Oliver vibes now. But anyway, he was someone who provided all of the things that good music teachers should. Um, there was a great deal of music going on in school um, when I was at secondary school, huge numbers of opportunities to get involved, lots of kind of affirmation and positive musical identity construction. So good music teachers, like mine, they can provide guidance for learning musical skills um, and in addition to that, opportunities to play and to participate. So not just kind of learning of skills but putting those to use in some kind of way. One other really important thing that they do is providing lots of encouragement and affirmation. It can often be the case that a child might not realise that music is a particular strength of theirs until somebody tells them that, gives them the confidence to participate in those kinds of activities. And in doing all of those things, music teachers can provide really secure foundations for lifelong music education and music participation. So it's not just about what goes on in school, it's about what happens afterwards. Now, of course, not all music teachers do that. I haven't yet seen the film Whiplash, and some people have advised me not to do so. But there are other models of music education in which um, very negative role models or um, very aggressive teaching or simply a lack of opportunity can cause people to feel that music isn't for them. And again, that shapes them for life. That can be something that means that they don't ever feel that they can participate and don't ever want to get involved in music later in life, which is, um, from my perspective, um, a great pity. So in my research, I set out to find out about musical life histories, to try and explore the ways in which people engage with music throughout their lives. And I asked a series of very open-ended, very simple questions in which I asked people for information about what they did in their formative years and also for their perspective on how that changed their attitudes to music throughout their lives. So some of these questions might resonate with you. What kind of music was going on in your home as a child? So it's important to recognise that music teachers, although they um, will have some level of influence, are also taking their part amongst lots of family music making too. And the interaction between those two things can be very important. What are your memories of school music? And that might be people or activities or opportunities. Who has been influential on your musical experience throughout your life? And that might include instrumental teachers, peers, siblings, sometimes really distant role models, so people you've never even met, but who inspired um, lifelong musical engagement in other ways. I asked people about the highlights of their musical life histories, and I also asked them about their regrets. And for anybody who had learnt an instrument as a child, the regret was always, I wish I'd done that practice that my parents were telling me to do. So some answers from the um, over 100 life history stories that I collected um, included the fact that instru instrumental teachers were very often more influential than classroom teachers. So there are problems in that, in that not everybody has access to usually privately funded instrumental teaching, but it was very often that one-to-one -one relationship that was the most powerful one in people's life stories. Um, so sometimes that was a very powerful, positive relationship, um, and other times there were stories of the kinds of teachers we hope don't exist anymore, as one person put it. So the kind of piano teacher who wraps you over the knuckles with a ruler if you're not getting the right notes. Um, for younger respondents, people who had um, learnt their musical skills later on, quite a few of them were self-taught or were more open to the idea of learning in other ways, so not necessarily going for the traditional one-to-one -one piano lesson model, but also um, kind of learning with peers, learning with friends, and acquiring their own levels of musical skill. That could lay very strong foundations for lifelong engagement, or it could leave them feeling that they'd missed out on some aspect of education. They might be very fluent oral players, for example, but feel less confident about reading music notation. And one thing that comes out quite strongly from the research is that there are so many different ways of becoming a musician that everybody tends to feel inadequate in one way, at least, because there are you know, other skills that will have been possible but that haven't been acquired through that particular route. 
Classroom teachers were remembered very vividly, particularly if they were providing both quantity of opportunities, so a sense that there was a lot of music going on in schools, as I described in my own case, and also quality of opportunity. So it wasn't enough just that there was a school orchestra, it had to be enjoyable to be there. And in another study looking at people who have lapsed in their musical participations, there were some stories of how that kind of participation in organised classical music had been, as one person put it, tainted by school. So it felt very institutionalised and therefore less enjoyable later in life. Connections between home and school music I found to be really important. So there can be fantastic music going on in school, but if it's not backed up at home, that can be problematic, and vice versa. If the music that the adolescent is involved in in their home life isn't backed up at school, then that starts to feel like a disjunction in musical identity. Also important was the sense of having musical ambitions and horizons beyond school. So very often um, school education is focused very much on the exams that are going to be the, the kind of immediate end product of what's going on. But looking beyond that, particularly in the case of an activity like music that will be taken on into later life, is really important. So making sure that music education isn't entirely teacher-directed, but is giving children the skills to go on and do that for themselves later on. And sense of musical identity as well. I've talked about that sense of affirmation, that sense of music being for you is something that school music can give very valuably. So looking at the outcomes, the, um, the, the end products of the life histories that I've investigated, I found that people who become music educators tend to be very flexible. They tend to be involved in lots of, lots of musical activities um, and very open-minded. Those who are lifelong listeners um, either regular concert goers or um, kind of heavy consumers of recorded music, very often would describe themselves as lapsed performers. And I think although they might describe that as a kind of um, failure in their performing, it can also be seen as one of the long-term impacts of music education, that having um, tried to make music as a child, they at least understand how it is made, that it's not something that is you know, magically acquired, it's something that takes effort and practice. Um, so lifelong learners are those people who remain open-minded to learning an instrument later in life. There has been for many years in music education research a kind of myth if you haven't started the piano by the time you're seven then you're doomed for life. Gladly, I'm, I'm seeing that kind of very much um, overturned in research that's happening now and there is much more of a sense that music is something that you can engage with at any stage. Um, and there were also a lot of people in my research who were um, music makers, so they wouldn't call themselves performers, they certainly weren't engaging in professional music making, but they had a sense of functional music making. They might be accompanying their own children as they learnt to play an instrument or playing in um, a worship setting. So making use of their musical skills, even if that wasn't the main focus of their life. And all of those, I would say, are valuable outcomes from music education. In education theory, there are often um, metaphors about what a teacher does, whether they're you know, filling a child with knowledge or facilitating their learning. And one of the metaphors that occurs a lot is about the teacher as a gardener, nurturing a kind of tiny seedling into a larger plant and then into one that's kind of stable and able to withstand everything. Now, I love gardening, but often my plants end up like this. And so I would suggest that although that gardening metaphor is useful, there's also an element of unpredictability in musical life histories, that those, many of those opportunities can be in place, but if there isn't that kind of magic ingredient, that music teacher who enthuses a child, that parent who supports their learning, then all of those opportunities can go to waste. So I would finish with um, a plea to support any music teachers that you know or to have confidence in your musical education activities if that's what you do, um, that music teachers can change lives through the opportunities that they offer and the open-mindedness that they engender in their students, remembering that those students are future teachers, future parents and future citizens who will have um, a long-term impact on music in the world. Um, if you would like to read more, there is plenty of it available. And if you would like to share your life history, then I would love to hear it. Please do get in touch. Thank you very much.